Okay, very good. Well, we're just a couple of minutes after the hour. Uh, let's go ahead and, and, and get started here. Um, I'll say that you know, I'm Lee Calcote. I'm the founder of uh, Layer 5 and a, a CNCF a Cloud Native Ambassador. I'll be moderating today's webinar, uh, but we would like to welcome our presenter today, uh, Julian Sobrier, uh, Head of Product at Octarine. Just before we um, hand things over to Julian, we've got a couple of housekeeping items. Yes, the slides will be posted. Yes, we are recording today. Uh, and uh, the recording of today's webinar should be up on the CNCF's uh, webinar site a little later today. Uh, now, you know, we should note that during today's webinar, um, while you won't be able to speak, your questions are highly encouraged. There is a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, so please feel free to drop your questions in there and we'll get to many, as many of those as we can. Um, as a reminder, that this is an official CNCF webinar, and so as such, um, it's the subject to the CNCF Code of Conduct. So please don't add anything to the chat or ask questions that would be in violation of that code uh, of conduct. Uh, but, you know, so basically, um, you know, be respectful of, the, of Julian, our presenter, and your fellow uh, webinar attendees. Uh, and with that, uh, it's time to hand things over to, to Julian. Uh, Julian, uh, over to you. Thank you, Lee. Uh, thank you for the introduction. So yes, I'm the uh, head of product at the Octarine, and I'm just going to give you a few words about Octarine that explain why we created the uh, KCCSS. So at Octarine, we provide a security solution for communities. Um, one part is covering the, the runtime with network IDS, behavior analysis, et cetera. And the second part is uh, looking and enforcing the configuration of workloads. And one thing we used to, to show to our customer is look how many of them are running as root, how many, uh, how many of them are running as privilege, how many of them as gap netro, et cetera. And the question we got from the customer is, okay, but out of all these uh, customer with some risky configuration, uh, uh, out of all of these risky uh, containers, which one I should look, look at first? Which one is most likely to put my um, whole cluster uh, at risk? So we realized that we needed a way to have a holistic approach of security for containers, look at all the security uh, settings of uh, containers uh, and give, the, give them a score uh, that the users can, 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 can use to figure out which one is the most dangerous, which one is the higher risk workload that they should address. Uh, the other thing that uh, we understood is that they uh, are about 30 uh, different uh, Kubernetes settings that directly affect the security of the workloads and understanding how these uh, security settings change together to make the security better or worse uh, is hard to understand. Uh, and in the end, it's hard to understand what is the actual risk uh, that you are uh, potentially facing. Um, it's not just about best practices, you know, minimizing the number of root containers, it's really about a specific risk uh, that you want to avoid or you want to, uh, to remediate. Um, and finally, the third thing we wanted to, to achieve is uh, give them a solution to remediate the high risk, because uh, there might be a good reason why they need to run a container as a root or a, co a privileged containers, but there are a number of uh, other changes that they might be able to do to lower the risk short of being able to just turn off uh, some of these uh, settings. So the first thing we did is look around at what are the existing security framework that maybe we could use for Kubernetes. Uh, there are a number of them, and probably the most uh, famous or the most used uh, today is the CVSS, the Common Vulnerability uh, Scoring System. Uh, you can already see the similarity in names between KCCSS and CVSS, and that's because we took a lot of inspiration from uh, CVSS. Uh, you're probably familiar with it if you are uh, scanning your Docker images. Uh, the scanner will uh, give you a list of vulnerabilities and the CVSS rating and explanation. And CVSS is very good at describing the risk for these vulnerabilities. It shows what is the impact to confidentiality, integrity, uh, availability of your application or server. Uh, it shows what is the potential scope 
uh, of the vulnerability can it be used to compromise just the application or the entire server or get access to your entire data center. Uh, it also explains how easy it is to exploit that vulnerability. Uh, um, is it a remote uh, vulnerability? Uh, does it require a local access, etc.? So CVSS is very good at describing and measuring the risk associated with individual uh, vulnerabilities. Uh, and from NIST, there is also the CCSS, which is CVSS uh, applied to configuration, the common configuration score scoring system. So when I first looked at that, so, so that's great, that's probably something we can use for Kubernetes configuration. Unfortunately, it's a pretty much a dead project. Uh, it's based on the version 2.0 of CVSS. CVSS is now in version 3.1 with quite a lot of improvement between uh, 2.0 and 3.0. So that's not something we um, really look, can use directly, but it's interesting to see you know, the idea of applying CVSS to configuration uh, is something that we definitely did. And the third project that we also uh, looked at is the um, CC, the Common Configuration Enumeration. Uh, unfortunately, it's also not uh, an active project, but what's interesting here is that it's a checklist of configuration settings, where CVSS gives you a framework, uh, but not really data that are provided by, by uh, other uh, part of the organization or by vendors. CC is really a checklist that you can go through one by one to check the security configuration of your application or, or server. So we decided that to take the best of these three uh, frameworks to create ACCSS. Uh, so we are, the, 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 it's a framework that also come with a list of rules, just like CC. So we created rules that describe the risk for the different Kubernetes uh, container settings. We describe the risk the same way as we do with uh, CVSS. And you see that in an instance. So we show what the impact for uh, security, how likely it is to be uh, exploited, uh, et cetera. And what we did is we made it more specific to uh, Kubernetes. So for example, there is a scope in, um, in CVSS about what can you uh, potentially impact. And you know, we changed the scope to be the container, uh, the node, and the cluster. And probably the most important, and probably the hardest as well, is that we really, in the end, wanted to show a, a risk score for the workload and not for the individual security settings. So we created a new formula that take all of the risk into consideration and give a score for the entire workload. So we have two types of risk, uh, two types of rules, sorry, the risk, uh, which is very similar to CSS. Uh, so we describe what is the impact for the availability of your container or cluster, confidentiality, you know, is it likely to be uh, to expose secrets, like so you can get access to secrets, and integrity, can you make changes to your container or cluster or you know, whatever scope. Uh, and for all of them, so it's rated from none, low, medium to high, again, just like CVSS. Uh, we also give uh, a, a description. We try to make it very specific. So no, again, not about uh, trying to um, enforce some best security st standards, but really understanding what is a potential risk that you're, that you're facing. Uh, so in this example, that's the uh, shared host network that's uh, enabled for containers. So we explain uh, that uh, it potentially um, can expose the container to the internet by binding the uh, container IP to the host IP, and that opens you to uh, no, those attacks. If you don't have any, anything in front of it, uh, it can be used to gain access to, um, to, a, to a container, to an application that's maybe not designed to be exposed to the internet. Uh, and also, it uh, allows you to do um, something quite different local this time, is to uh, be able to sniff the uh, loopback interface on the container, which means give you access, uh, let you uh, see the traffic from uh, other containers. So that's why the impact to confidentiality is high, the impact to availability is high, but the impact to integrity is, uh, is low. Then just like CVSS, we explain uh, how easy it is to exploit it, uh, whether it's uh, something that's exploitable uh, remotely or require local access and what the potential uh, impact. So we do that for all the rules. I think we have about 
25 to 30 uh, uh, risk roles today in case, case CSS. And I think it's interesting just to, to read through them and, and hopefully you, you, you learn a few things about what is the actual risk associated with all of these um, uh, settings. Uh, we also learned from, from a lot of users that you know, maybe the first person who look at it might be a DevOps person uh, who might be more familiar with risk and security. Uh, but when they want to share it with the developer, uh, explaining why uh, they need to address the way the particular container is, um, is configured, they need to really be able to um, convey what's, what's the risk and why it should be um, uh, taken care of. Uh, the other type of rule that doesn't exist in CVSS is remediation. So there are security settings that, uh, that make your security uh, better. Uh, for example, having a service mail that encrypts uh, all of the traffic uh, means uh, in the case before where you could sniff traffic from other containers, if it's all encrypted, then uh, you're not at risk of uh, exposing secrets, for example. So the, the remediation are described the same way as risk. We show how they remediate uh, the integrity, confidentiality, and availability, uh, whether they remediate local attacks or uh, remote attacks and whether they uh, protect the container or uh, the node or, or the entire cluster. So uh, the, the risk core uh, is we first look at all the individual risk associated with the container. So we map the security uh, settings of the container with the, the risk rule that we have. Uh, for each of them, we uh, compute a score from zero, that's zero risk to 10, and it's, it's just like CVSS. Um, at a high level, the risk has two components. One is based on the impact um, of, the, of the risk. Now, if it's impacting, if it has high impact on availability, high impact on confidentiality, high impact on integrity, and potentially can compromise your entire cluster, that part of the risk will be uh, larger. Uh, but the other part, uh, equally important, is based on the exploitability. So how easy is it to uh, take advantage of uh, a misconfiguration or a risky configuration? And that's based on whether it's local, which is harder or remote, uh, remotely accessible, and whether it's easy or not to uh, exploit um, the issue. So we just add uh, both of them, and we, that gives you uh, a, a risk for an individual um, uh, risk rule. Uh, so you might have uh, a risk that has very high impact, uh, but very low exploitability, and the overall uh, score might be lower or the same as uh, a risk that's medium, but it's very easy to, uh, to exploit. So the first step is we, we create a multiple risk score for each uh, setting of uh, one workload. Then from this risk, uh, we compute the, the score for the entire workload. And the way we are doing it today, we're working on the version, but what we have today works, uh, works very well, uh, is we um, look at all the risk and the attack vector and scope. Uh, if two risks share the same attack vector and scope, we take the maximum score and we uh, add them up and, and take the square root. So that gives us the workload score, again, from zero to 10, uh, based on the individual uh, risk that we um, computed earlier. I've mentioned risk so far, right? But I said that they're also remediation. Um, so when we uh, look at all the individual risk, uh, we try to find a matching remediation. And uh, what we call matching today is remediation that has the same attack vector um, and the same scope uh, as the risk. So the risk has um, uh, cluster scope and uh, remote, um, remotely uh, exploitable. We look for um, uh, remediation that have the same um, scope, uh, cluster scope and uh, remote remediation. Uh, we take the, so once we have the, the remediation, uh, we, we um, basically lower the impact by the remediation. So if a uh, risk was high for confidentiality, and remediation was low for confidentiality, then we modify the risk to be medium, one notch down. If we had a high risk, uh, but high remediation, we don't go all the way to none because typically remediation don't uh, exclude 100% of the, of the risk, but lower it to, uh, to 
a very low level. So we go from high to, to low. So we, we basically do risk minus remediation. We have this modified risk, and that's the risk we use in our formula uh, to, um, in, in step one and to be used for the, for the workload. So KCCSS is a framework that comes with a list of rules, uh, but the idea is that you're not going to run it by yourself, trying to manually map these rules to your clusters, manually uh, run the formula, uh, but instead that there are going to be tools that do the work for you, scanner that will look at your workload configuration, map it to um, the KCCSS rules, and give you this, uh, this core. And with, along with KCCSS, we have uh, open sourced uh, CubeScan, which is um, a container scanners uh, that comes as a container itself that you install in your cluster. It scans the uh, workload that are currently running in your, in your clusters and show you the risk score and the risk details in a nice uh, web UI. But the idea is that there could be other uh, tools that are created later by us or by, by, by other people who can take advantage of KCCSS and, and show you the same type of results. Okay, so that, that's the theory. Let me show you how it uh, looks like uh, in practice and uh, I'll do a demo. And at the uh, end of the demo, I think I can answer some question. Hopefully that will clarify anything that I've uh, shown so far. And, uh, and then I'll conclude with a couple of uh, slides. So before I show you CubeScan um, running, let me uh, show you the CubeScan uh, GitHub page. Um, so it's a public repository. Uh, you can Google for CubeScan GitHub, CubeScan Octarine, and uh, you'll probably find this page first. Uh, so what it is here is a description of the project. It has a link to uh, the KCCSS framework. I'll show you the GitHub page uh, in a minute. Uh, it explains how uh, it works, what you're going to see with screenshots, uh, but probably more important for you, it explains how to install it. Um, so obviously you can always compile everything from source and create your own Docker file, but we've uh, up uploaded the um, um, container image in a repository so you can take advantage of that and just do a kubectl apply uh, and install the, the containers uh, in one comment. We have two ways of uh, installing kubescan. Um, the more secure way is to install the containers and do a kubectl port forward to access the web UI from your computer. Uh, if for some reason you want to expose it to colleagues or to other people, it's also possible to um, use the other type of installation that include the load balancer. So it's exposed, uh, the web UI can be, can be exposed. Just be careful to not expose it to the internet. You don't want to give away too much information about your, your cluster. And when you're done, you can, again, with one uh, kubectl command, you can just uh, uh, delete the pod, uh, the pod in your time. Um, so I was saying that um, there is also a link to the KCCSS. Uh, I just wanted to briefly show you um, uh, what kind of information we have here. So we have information about the project, mostly what I've described um, in, um, in the slides, how you can create your own rules. We really made KCCSS easy to extend. Uh, so you can create both new risk rules new uh, remediation uh, rules and really hope that uh, we are going to have more rules that uh, describe how open source solution or even proprietary solutions can imp improve your, um, your security posture or sometimes how some application that you install have additional risk um, associated to them. So adding uh, the corresponding case CSS rules so you have uh, an exact um, understanding of uh, your, your cluster. So I was mentioning the, 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 the rules. I'm oh, sorry. Getting lost with the shortcuts. Okay, here we are. So under rules, we have uh, risk remediation, the whole um, YAML file. We have a couple of tools that can uh, validate uh, so you don't have to enter all the information, things like uh, the risk, the score uh, are computed automatically. You just need to fill out 
um, the description and the impact if you want to create new roles. Uh, we have the same for remediation, and we are looking at adding more for specific tools. Uh, we have a wiki. Uh, that's the last thing I wanted to show you on GitHub, where we have more information. Um, so specifically, if you're familiar with CVSS, we have a, a more in-depth comparison of KCCSS and CVSS. Uh, more more explanation about the different fields in the role and some um, information about how to contribute. Okay, so let me show you KubeScan. So we have installed KubeScan in our demo environment. We have about 50 different uh, workloads here. Uh, so when we install KubeScan, when we run it for the first time, it scans the current configuration of all the workloads, computing the, computing the risk, and we can see that we have risk ranging from eight all the way to five. So we can already know that the most risky one is this Echo A um, deployment. Uh, we have a couple of settled sets. It show you the type of uh, Kubernetes object um, that it is and where it's located in which namespace. And this is just for one cluster. Um, so we don't show the cluster here, but that's the cluster when you installed um, KubeScan. You can click on the score here, and it will give you the list of all the risk and remediations. And we can take a look at a couple of them. Uh, so we see that the highest risk here is that we are mounting some uh, host paths in the container um, with right permission and at the sensitive uh, host path uh, directory. So we can click on show more and it explains exactly why it's, um, it's, uh, it's risky. So um, this is um, uh, about mounting uh, uh, sensitive host paths like slash, varan, uh, docker, that's uh, um, so one of these um, host paths that you really don't want to be mounting in a, in a container because it can give the container access to Docker, modify how Docker is running, uh, lets you maybe through a socket file interact with application, uh, read secrets, uh, modify binaries on the host. Um, so all of the different risks in the different categories are explained here. Uh, it's very easy to exploit, right? It's just about reading and writing to files once you get uh, local access and it can potentially impact the entire node, not just the, the container. So you can go through a list. Uh, again, it's it's you know, very interesting as seen for education. Um, if you have you no know, team of developers who are not necessarily uh, aware of the risk associated with you know, the many different uh, container settings that they have to set. Um, you know, Netro is, is another good example, right? The fact that you can craft um, uh, any kind of packets means you can do man in the middle attack. Um, so that's why the impact on confidentiality is uh, is high. Uh, so you can go through a list, and we can see here that there are no um, no risk, uh, no remediation. Sorry, only only a risk. If we look at some other workload that has a lower risk, like shoes here. Uh, so we see that it does also some uh, some risk, but it has a couple of remediation that bring down the risk uh, quite a lot. One is the fact that uh, there's no listening port. So this service is not listening to any incoming traffic, which means it's, it's remediating basically all kind of remote attacks uh, by not just by not accepting traffic. So uh, there's not actually any uh, vulnerable, uh, any risky configuration that, that has to do with uh, uh, remote access, but if we had any, um, that would remedy, do, be a very good remediation for all of this risk. Um, same thing, it has a service mesh, in this case it's Optime, but it could be Istio or anything else with, um, uh, with encryption, so that means uh, it's now much harder for any workload that can sniff traffic to get any, any content. So it remediates specifically the uh, confidentiality and, and not so much the other, uh, uh, the other types of, uh, of risk. Uh, so again, that, that's very interesting, I, I think, to really understand, you know, if I, if I install a service mesh and I do enable encryption, what kind of risk do I take care of and what kind of risk actually remains? Um, so the service mesh is not 
security answer for everything. It's, it's, it's a security answer for a specific type of risk. Uh, I think that's it for them. Oh, actually, no, I wanted to show you another thing that we, we see quite a lot um, uh, in, in many users. So this one has a medium risk. Um, actually, it's, it should be high. Uh, it's actually a bug that we're going to fix. Seven is supposed to be, uh, to be high. Uh, but what's interesting here is that it's a workload that's exposed for an external load balancer, uh, so potentially accessible through the internet, which by itself, again, is not necessarily a big deal. There, there, there are uh, workload that are supposed to be um, exposed to the internet, but it does not have any uh, CPU or memory limits. Uh, so what happens if you get uh, a dose on this, uh, uh, on, on this uh, workload that's accessible from the uh, internet and you don't have any kind of rate limit in the front, uh, you know, then you potentially uh, are, will be using too many resources on the pod and you know, the, the, on, on the node, sorry, and the node is going to uh, or try to reschedule uh, other um, pods on different nodes, and you may have cascading failures. Um, also, what's, what's um, interesting with uh, having uh, something that's exposed to the internet is that you are potentially chaining uh, local um, risk uh, with um, uh, remote access uh, through the load balancer. So, if you have any kind of vulnerability in your code, uh, in your own application running in the container in the OS, uh, that can be used to chain uh, remote access with local vulnerability. So that's also something you want to pay attention to uh, when you have a very uh, large uh, or a lot of privilege, local privileges, making sure that they are not accessible uh, remotely. So I encourage everybody to download kubescan um, and, and try it in their own cluster. You can just remove it when you're done. Uh, it's open source, you can look at the code. Uh, you'll see that uh, we don't export any information, so it doesn't connect to the internet. So you can even run it in an air gap environment. Uh, nothing is being sent out. It, it's running 100% uh, locally without any uh, internet access. The only thing is incoming traffic, so you can actually uh, access the web UI. Uh, so that's it for the demo. Uh, I have, uh, I think, two slides to conclude, but I think that's a good time to answer some questions, if there are any. Um, so I can um, oh. share with oh, awesome. uh, Very good. So, so Julian, if I heard you correctly there at the end, you're saying that, that this open source security project is, in fact, itself very secure, right? With Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Okay, great. Well, this is a fantastic presentation. Um, we've got um, a few different questions that have, have come in uh, in the time that you've been giving it. So, so very good. So, uh, a fair bit of interest here. Uh, let, let me let me toss a couple of your way. Um, and, and this first one um, came in a little bit earlier, but the, the question is is asking you know, how it is how is it that the workloads are enumerated. Uh, using kubescan yes so that's a, a very good question so we often ask we are I often ask you know, what do you look at with kubescan do you look, do you look at uh, configuration files uh, what happens if i install my uh, workload with m charts or operators so kubescan look at the runtime configuration of your workload so the um, it doesn't matter if your workload was installed you know, with a yaml file uh, uh, or with m chart or if operators are, are making any change, it's looking at the, at the runtime configuration uh, through Kubernetes. Makes sense, oh, very good. Well, there are, we've got a, a couple of collection of questions that are somewhat related to one another. So I'm gonna conflate two of them and let's see if there's a difference. Um, the, the first one's um, rather straightforward, it's, it's um, a question about compatibility with OpenShift and whether or not um, you know, Kubescan has been is compatible with OpenShift. So yes, it works uh, on any any cloud provider, uh, also with OpenShift. Um, it, it's it's using the the standard Kubernetes uh, API, um, so it will work with any Kubernetes distribution. Nice. 
on the topic of compatibility, and another question thrown in there is, um, is compatibility with AWS Fargate tasks uh, or like Google, Google Cloud Run instances? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know if you have tried it. Um, I'll, uh, I'll check. Um, I'm not sure if we have tried it on, on Fargate or, or Google Run. Fair enough. Very, very good. Um, back to the, and I guess, I'm gonna, like I said, we're going to conflate two things. There's a couple of questions about pod security policies or PSP enabled um, Kubernetes clusters. Um, is, do you know if, if CubeScan has been used in that environment? Is there compatibility there? Um, so it, it's, uh, so I don't know if the question is, you no, know, how does it look at, does it look like at the, does it look, does it look, sorry, at the pod security policy or does the pod security policy will prevent CubeScan from, uh, from running? Um, so the answer should be, you know, if it should work in, 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 in many strict, with many strict pod security policy, uh, but also it um, it really looks at the, the current configuration. Uh, which will be uh, enforced, if you want, by your, your pod security policy. Uh, but really, it looks like it looks at how the 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 containers are actually running, uh, not the policy that's being set, but really how they are running uh, at that time. Okay, got it. And I think some of the attendees are interested in um, just, just the furtherance of. Uh, CubeScan and its compatibility with, or its its cognizance of, pod security policies. So, so very very good. Uh, another uh, just you know lots of questions coming through. So, uh, another question here is um, whether or not it's possible to restrict CubeScan to a specific namespace. Uh, so not yet. We have uh, an issue open for that. Um, um, so we are we are looking at you know doing something like that in, uh, in the coming days or weeks. Right now, it looks at your entire, um, entire cluster. Oh, very good. Okay. You can, you can if you're only interested in, in the namespace, you can do a filtering by namespace. Um, so you can, you can organize them by namespace and not by, not by risk. Um, uh, but yes, yeah, sc scanning, uh, there's an issue open for, for just running it on specific namespace or namespaces. Okay, very good. Um, another question here has to deal with um, whether or not the configuration items align with CIS benchmarks. So that's interesting. So yes, um, we looked at CIS benchmark to make sure that we had rules that covered everything. Uh, that's one of the reasons why we uh, added some of the RBAC rules. I think I checked them in yesterday or, or Monday. Uh, so everything that you will see in CIS is covered and, and much more. Uh, so everything related, I should say, everything related to containers. Uh, so in the latest um, CIS benchmark 1.5, if I remember correctly, things like 5.x, 5.3, 5.6, 5.7, um, that will, uh, that, is, uh, that, is, that is part of it. We don't ref reference the CIS benchmark necessarily, um, uh, but it is, it, is, it is covered, yes. In the end, CIS benchmark is also about uh, container settings, at least in, in section five, uh, and that's what we cover. Okay, uh, very good. Uh, a related question is that um, whether or not the attack vectors align with the uh, MITRE attack framework, the ATT, and CK framework? Yeah, so we use the attack vector from CVSS um, and it's only local and um, local and remote. Um, we are adding something that's a bit similar to one of the Mitre framework that classify the types of attacks. Uh, so again, we do it specifically for Kubernetes and we, we are starting to add that kind of information uh, a better classification of the type of risk um, to improve the formula, especially to improve um, the way we match uh, risk with remediation. So we, we, we will, we are adding categories like secret exposure, um, uh, lateral movement, um, Kubernetes, 
privilege escalation, uh, this kind of thing. So uh, that will allow us to, uh, to have more granularity when we uh, match the risk and the remediation um, and for the workload formula. So it's the same spirit as the Mitre uh, attack framework, but uh, uh, it's very specific to Kubernetes. Um, so there will be fewer categories and they will be a bit different um, than this framework. Okay, under understood. Oh, very good. Well, there's just a couple of final questions and I think just some, you know, some interest and feedback on um, pod security policies. And so the, you know, the, the, the question here is, you know, the, that or the, the note here is that there may be multiple PSP policies in the environment. So, you know, some for infrastructure components, um, some for tenants. And the, the question being, you know, whether or not CubeScan ensures that the correct PSP policies are taken into account while evaluating risk. And so. Uh, so I think again, because we, we're lo looking at what, how is the, the um, container running and not how it's been configured originally. Um, you know, it, it includes any kind of change, whether it's for a policy or uh, again, operators or, or anything. Um, so in the end, what, what we're looking at is the current state of the workload, uh, not how it was originally uh, configured, but really how it's running right now. Um, so that would include you know, what policies are being enforced because they changed, uh, they might change how the, 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 configure, the workload is running, but it's really how it's running right now and, and not how it's been set up or configured. All right, very good. I think we, we are, we, we hit the bottom of the bucket on our questions. Um, so Julian, if, if you had had a couple of other slides, um, yes. we're ready for those. Okay, so let me conclude. So I, I just uh, wanted to talk about what's, uh, what's next. Uh, so I already mentioned that we are looking at better ways to match remediation and, uh, and risk. Uh, and that's mostly by introducing um, more granular categories. Uh, we're always looking at making the workload risk uh, better. Um, we want to add more rules. We just added a couple of uh, around the RPAC this week, and we're looking at a few more on secrets, uh, env environment variable, for example. And we welcome any suggestion. I'm sure we are, we are missing uh, some of them. Uh, the next big step will probably be to expand outside of Kubernetes, because typically a Kubernetes cluster lives in a bigger environment when you have, you have other controls, especially on the network side, uh, um, things like load balancer that are uh, in front of all the ingress traffic, uh, network policy uh, that also uh, in the end uh, change the, the risk profile of your, of your cluster. And finally, more, more tool for KCCSS. So I think you know, outside of KubeScan, just having a better understanding of the risk, how the risk interact with each other, what kind of um, remediation you can apply. I think that's very useful. So we wanted to make, uh, make it easier to explore the KCCSS framework. Um, so um, stay tuned, next couple of weeks, we'll have more and more tools, including uh, uh, more online tools to do that. Uh, we just checked in again this week, uh, a few basic tools to validate and, um, and start playing with these uh, uh, roles. So if you look for KCCSS, um, you should be able to do a simple Google search for GitHub KCCSS or uh, Opering KCCSS. Uh, you'll find um, um, the, the GitHub homepage. You can also go to our website, opringsec.com, and at the very top, there is a, an open source uh, tab. Uh, you can uh, click on it, and uh, you'll get information about KubeScan and KCCSS. If you have any question uh, that either I couldn't answer here or was not clear on, or if it's just new question that comes up, but don't hesitate to email me. My email address here, uh, Julian with the e at openinsect.com. Uh, feel free also to open uh, issues. Uh, we are looking for uh, PRs and uh, you know, new roles. So I hope some of you will, will contribute to uh, KCCSS and KubeScan as well. Oh, wow, well, this is a great, great presentation, Julian. Uh, we did have uh, another question come through and just, uh, I think, 
another um, Kubernetes engine um, user uh, just looking to affirm uh, compatibility or just to, I guess to sort of answer that same question again does does uh, kubescan work in, in GKE yes uh, so I think the demo that we showed was actually in GKE uh, the demo environment is in GKE and the container was installed in GKE so yes uh, AWS uh, Azure Google uh, OpenShift, uh, they work for sure. Uh, Fargate again and Google Run, uh, we haven't tried. Um, uh, right. Specific environments, we you can you can let me know. I think that it doesn't work. Uh, either open an issue directly on GitHub or send me an email and uh, and we'll uh, we'll look at it. Nice. Okay. Very good. Um, another question um, was whether or not there's any plans to get this integrated to the community as an off-the-shelf product. So yes, uh, we haven't uh, engaged with with anybody yet. We we wanted to make sure that um, there's some maturity in the in the project uh, and that we have a, a enough feedback to know exactly what direction we want to go. Uh, but yes, we'll be um, uh, looking at uh, CNCF uh, probably uh, and see if we can put uh, the project under that, uh, that umbrella or some other uh, open source uh, organization. Oh, very good. Well, all right. I, I think that you know, th those are all the questions that, um, that we have today. Well, so thanks so much all for joining us on the, this CNCF webinar. Um, the webinar recording and the slides will be online later today. And so we're looking forward to seeing you all at a future CNCF webinar. And thank you so much for telling us about KCSS, KCCSS, Julian, and Cubescan. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Lee. All right. Very good. Have a good day, everyone.